Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love Online. And God is raising up leaders in these last days. He's honing us. He's strengthening us. He's teaching our hands to war. He is building us up on the inner man. And he's, he's also purifying and purging us at the same time. Cutting off all that fat. Cutting off all that grease. All that flesh. Yay, cutting it away, y'all. Chiseling for days. Till we become that beautiful vessel. <laughs> Earthen vessel, no doubt. But beautiful. He's beautifying us day by day. There's an old song that says, he took me and made something beautiful out of my life. He took a wretch, a wretch like me, and showed me his love and concern. And by his grace, he made my life a new and better one. I owe him my all. I cannot let him down because he's the one who made something beautiful out of my life. Amen. We are reading 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 8. But we know that the law is good. If a man uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. So listen to this, y'all. I got to in interject Pat's two cents here and there. You know how I do. When we're talking about a righteous man, we're not talking about perfect people. We're talking about the people of God in Christ Jesus. We know we're not perfect. We live with us every day. And God certainly knows we're not perfect. But our righteousness is there because we have clothed ourselves in Christ. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And the Holy Spirit fills us with the nature of God. And our own nature slowly begins to die and fall away over time. The quicker and the more we obey God, the quicker and the more we are purified for God's use. All right. So I just wanted to share that in case you guys think that we think we're better than you. No, that's not the case. We're, we are reckoned as righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Now, starting at verse 8 again. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. So in other words, we don't need the law. See, the law is written in our hearts. But for the lawless and disobedient. So that's who the law is for. The lawless and the disobedient. For the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane. Now, a lot of you, 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 you know, you got your picks and your your choices and picks as to what God considers sin. Mm, but we're going to hear it right now. For the ungodly, for the sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for those of you who are in gangs, for whoremongers, for those of you who bed hop. I used to do it. For them that defile themselves with mankind, for those of you who live a homosexual lifestyle, for man stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, those of you who live a life of deceit and you, you just live a life of treachery. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. How many of you is God getting ready to put into the ministry? A lot of you are on the job training right now. Age has no, age has nothing to do with it. God develops each one on an individual basis. So don't think by the time you're this age or that age, you should have been doing this, that, or the other. I'm a perfect example of that one. Don't go by age, y'all. You got to go by God's clockwork. 
I'm going to read that again. Verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me for that. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a, pers perse a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus came unto me world, excuse me, that Jesus, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it? For this cause, I obtain mercy that in me, first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. I'm going to read verse 18 because this is for all of us. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that that thou by them mightest war a good warfare holding faith in a good conscience, which some have put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. You know, we don't realize all that God has put in our arsenal when he calls us to the ministry. Now, when I say call you to the ministry, I'm not talking that everybody who's called to the ministry is preaching in a pulpit. Not everybody called to the ministry is preaching. Hmm. Some of you, you think that being called to the ministry means that you have to mount a pulpit with the Bible and you're preaching a sermon. Ministry means service. Whatever God has called you to do. I remember when I was ordained back in 2000, uh, back in 2020, I mean, 2001. I remember Pastor Paul Binion. He told me, uh, during the interview for the ordination, he said, a lot of people think that only preachers should be ordained. He said, in my opinion, if you're doing prison ministry, if you're going to convalescent homes, if you're feeding the hungry, if you've got a, a, um, a clothing ministry, a pantry ministry, a uh, a, a, a ministry riding people all over, hospital ministry. Uh, he said, if you have a faithful ministry you've been doing for years and you're ministering the word of God to people, however you do it, one-on-one -on -one or in front of a crowd, you're ministering Jesus Christ to people. You're bringing the gospel to the world. You're touching lives. He said, you deserve to be ordained for ministry. So that's what I always appreciated about the way he saw ministry. It's not just preaching a sermon, y'all. It's not just standing out on the street corner with a, a mega horn, hollering out the gospel. It's what you do for people's lives. It's the prayer ministry, the intercessions, the the deliverance. Some of you are, have never even thought of doing deliverance ministry, and there are people all over the place need to be delivered. How many devils have you cast out of people? Now, I'm not fussing. I'm just giving you food for thought. When you're ministry-minded, anything can be ministry. I am telling you. All right. So what I want to share with you is sometimes you have to open up your mind. Now, the other scripture I got was dealing with what a bishop should be like, and I'm going to go to it now. I almost forgot to mark that page, but it's only three chapters ahead. So let's go to, let me make sure I'm right there. Okay, yes. First Timothy chapter 3. I'm not going to go all into it. But I just want to share this. I'm laying the groundwork for the message. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good, a good work. Father, I ask you to help me with this message. 
I ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to help me touch on the things you want touched on. Help me highlight what you want me to highlight and do it your way. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you for your anointing. Verse two, a bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, vigilant, sober of good behavior. Good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So you're not only ready to teach, you're apt to, so you, you need to be not only able to teach, but teachable. Always remember, if God uses you in a teaching ministry, you must always be in a learning position, a learning posture, always. Never think you have the last word on the word. Never think you have the last word on the gospel. You have the last word on doctrine. You have the last word on theology. Never think that of yourself. Because once you think you have arrived, baby, you have just shut down shop. You have eliminated yourself from God teaching you. Never think that you're not able to be taught, even from a five-year-old. If you think that a five-year-old child can't tell you something you don't know, you're in a bad way. Step aside, baby. Sit back down. You're not ready. Verse three, <clears throat> not given to wine, no striker. You know, some of you, I've heard, I've heard of many couples where the husband or the wife is the pastor and they go to blows. I mean, they're socking it. They're knocking each other out. That is crazy. No striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. I remember I went with a friend of mine years ago before I was saved. We sat at a at a a, a bar, you know. I'm I'm I never was a drinker that much, but she wanted a drink and I wanted a coke. <laughs> so we sat at the bar, and I had never been there before. And there were a couple of guys sitting there minding their own business, and my friend, oh my goodness, I was so embarrassed I didn't know what to do. My friend looked at one of the guys. They just happened to pass glances. Not a big deal. And she said, what are you looking at? You have a problem? I'm looking at her like, you got a problem, girl. What, what did that come from? And the man probably didn't even realize he was looking at it. He's probably looking through her, thinking about something else. You know, I mean, there are just people out there that are hankering, just, just eager for a fight. It's so silly. What's up with that, y'all? All right. Verse five, no, verse four, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Yes, yeah, some of y'all, your children got you subject. Your children rule the, the nest. They, they run that house and you bow to their every whim. That's backwards, y'all. Five, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have good report, a good report of them which are without. All the people that know him from all walks of life need to be able to vouch for him. That's, that's my way of putting it. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. You know, we do not realize we are held to a higher standard. You don't realize that. If, <clears throat> see, God is honing a lot of you. You're going through, some of you are going through all the annoyances of life that you can handle. And you're wondering why is it so hard? Well, let me share a couple of reasons. One reason, because God is trying to purge you and clean you. He's building your character. 
He's preparing you for your assignment, for your divine call. Another reason is because the devil is attacking you because he wants to discourage you from ever seeing who you're supposed to be. So he clouds your mirror. So when you look at the mirror, you see a small, insignificant nobody looking back at you. You don't see the giant in you that the devil sees, and he wants to keep it that way. He paints a cartoon character over your mirror so you don't see the giant of a warrior that God made you out to be. Number three, mm -hmm. because the anointing comes through crushing. The crushing brings the anointing. That's how you get the oil out of an olive, through crushing. So there are times God uses the necessary evils in life to hone you, to shape you, to purge you, to purify you, to clean up your love, to clean up your attitude, to clean up your outlook on people, how you see people. Remove that judgmental attitude. Remove that level of intolerance that you have with certain shortcomings and problems and weaknesses. So what does he do? He shows you yours through life's vicissitudes. Why? Because he doesn't want you thinking more highly of yourself than you are. It's not to humiliate you. It's to keep you humble. In other words, he wants to constantly remind you through life, your stuff stinks. Don't look at their stink, baby. You got enough of your own to spray away. And when you find yourself not getting so impatient with people, with stuff, with issues, with problems, you realize, oh, it's not them. It's not her. It's not him. But it's me, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I'm the problem. Because once this problem gets solved, that is no longer even seen as a problem. It's just seen as a simple hurdle that needs to be overcome. Not a big deal. I don't see the person as my enemy. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, etc., etc., etc. So you will find that as you go through life and as you deal with the challenges and you deal with the stresses and you deal with the frustrations and you deal with the setbacks, the delays, the losses, the failures. you will realize God is honing you. You're in boot camp, baby. You're getting ready for war. You're in boot camp. You're getting ready to be honed as a leader. But the greatest leaders, I'll tell you this right now, the greatest leaders start out as the greatest followers. And I'm not talking about the one that follows trends, styles, fashion. I go where they go. I do what they do. I say what they say. I be what they be. No, I'm not talking that kind of follower. No, you set your own trench, baby. You set your own trends. You, 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 you pay your own road. You don't let somebody else dictate to you what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do it, and how you're supposed to look while you're doing it, because that's what everybody does. No, that's not the kind of follower I'm talking about. I'm talking about a student at Jesus' feet, a student of the word. You watch what Jesus did. Hear what Jesus said. See how he did it. How he handled the broken. How he handled the lost. How he handled the hypocrites. How he handled people, period. 
And he will be your model as to how you are to handle people. Because whatever he did, be it tender and sweet and meek or harsh and stern, it was all done in love. Why? Jesus is God. Jesus is the word. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Yeah, later on it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. So what I want to share with you is with Jesus already being God, what does the Bible say about God? God is love. So if God is love, Jesus is love. And guess what? The Holy Ghost is love. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what we have in us. So if we have the Holy Spirit in us, how dare we say that we are the children of God if we don't love our brother? How intolerant can you be, baby? The more you love, guess what? The more tolerance you have. So there's a song. I'm going to recite a portion of it to you. Show me how to love in the true meaning of the word. Teach me to sacrifice, expecting nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm emphasizing the nothing in return. I want to give my life away, becoming more like you each and every day. My words are not enough. Please show me how to love. We think we love because we say I love you. But we will not inconvenience ourselves and do what we don't want to do as long as we can avoid it, baby. Trust me, we're not going to do it. We're just not. If it puts us out, if it's inconvenient, if we have to use too much gas, if we got to deal with too much traffic, guess what? It ain't going to happen, baby. Now, I'm not making myself the standard, so don't get that wrong idea. I just want to share something. There was a taxi cab driver um, when I was without a car for a minute. And I was trying to lead this guy to the Lord. And every time he heard my name come up, he would always grab the car, the ride and come and pick me up. And half the time he wouldn't even charge me. He would just charge me part or whatever. But we would sit and talk about the Lord before I got out of that car. And I shared with him the things, the benefits of walking with the Lord and how he could experience things that maybe he had never experienced before. Maybe he had been longing for thinking there was no hope. And I was trying to build up his faith and trusting God to accept Jesus, right? So I wasn't preaching at him. I was just conversing with him. Sometimes y'all choke, y'all make people gag, you shove the word at him so hard. But anyway, so I was sharing with him. Well, after a while, he got sick and he gave me a call and he asked me if I could. He said, one of my buddies, if you can, I'm going to send one of the taxi drivers to pick you up because I need to go to the veterans and uh, I, I can't drive. My leg is killing me. So the taxi cab driver took me down to his house and I got in his cab. And, and we helped him down the stairs and put him in the passenger seat. And I drove him out to the veterans hospital. Now, check it out. A year or two later, the Lord had already let me know. I knew the man was going to be dead by the end of April, the beginning of March. I knew it because he had planned to reach out to the children in the neighborhood, he was going to turn his cab over for a van and take the kids out on boat rides to take them fishing. That's ministry. But his life wasn't going to last that long. And I knew it. As soon as he said it, I knew he wasn't going to be there past March. I just knew it. It was a knowing. So one day I get uh, this guy is beeping his horn, beep, 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 beep. Now I look out the window and it's one of his taxi cab friends. And he said, Pat, 
Jay, Jay is in the uh, hospital. You need to go see him. He's in bad shape. He had open heart surgery, and they don't think he's going to make it. So check this out. I'm, I'm saying this to show you our practical ministry is. you got to be ministry-minded, because if you're not, you will never inconvenience yourself, y'all. <clears throat> I don't like driving at night on the freeway in the rain. I don't. I hate it. I'm a good driver. I'm not a scary driver. I'm not a nervous driver at all. But I don't like driving in the rain at night on the freeway. There's some nuts out there. And when the rain is pouring, it, the visibility is horrible. Okay. Be that as it may, he's all the way out at the Veterans Hospital. And when I'm finally able to go, it is pouring down rain. And I got to drive out there by myself. I wasn't married to Milton. Milton and I weren't even dating. I'm on my own on this one. I don't have no brothers, sisters, sons, daughters to take me out there, go with me, friends that'll, that'll keep me company. I'm doing this by myself. Most of my ministry I did by myself. So here I am driving out to the Veterans Hospital almost an hour away in the rain, which made it like a two and a half hour drive at night. And I get out there and he's unconscious. And I led him to the Lord. I prayed over his soul. I sat and talked with him. I sang to him. I ministered to him. He couldn't respond back to me. But I took my time in case I couldn't get back out there. I took my time because I wanted to make sure. The only thing I got was his eyebrow went up. <clears throat> you know, if you are ministry-minded, inconvenience won't stop you. If you're ministry-minded. Um... I remember about, I guess it was about eight months ago, Peter, he lives in Orange County. I live up here, up in the hills. And I drove, I guess it was an hour and 20 minutes for me. Peter drove 30 to 40 minutes. And we get to this lady's house and minister to her husband who found out he's got cancer. The sad part is, see, I asked the Lord this. I asked the Lord to never allow me to become, to be fearful on the road. I don't ever want anything. If any member of God's church of love gets sick, I want to be able to grab a credit card if I have to. Hop on a plane. And fly out and pray for them. Do battle with them in prayer. I might have to sleep on the floor. But I want to do ministry. I don't want my life to be about me, my four, and no more. And when you are about ministry, you don't have time to be lonely. You don't have time to be jealous. You don't have time to be fearful because you're too busy looking after other people. And what the what does the Bible say? We just mentioned this earlier today. When you water others, you water yourself. So you have to, when you are kingdom-minded, your life doesn't revolve around the comforts of home. You'll go wherever to do whatever to get the job done. Uh, there was a, um, a ministry I used to do. I think I did this ministry for about seven or eight years. And in the morning, I would drive out by myself, hour and a half drive, hour and 15 minutes, depending on traffic. I would drive out to Vent to Camarillo, Venturi Youth Correctional Facility, preach for two sermons, have lunch with them and their nasty food, 
and then sit in the chaplain's office and counsel with them all afternoon. Do you know how full my life is? It's not full because I have money. It's not full because I get to go on vacations with my family. I ain't got no family to go with. I'm by myself. The more you pour yourself into other people, the more you pour yourself into other people's needs, you minister the word to their pain. You minister the word to their confusion. You bring light into their darkness. You don't have time to be caught up in me, myself, and I. What about me? What about me? What about me? You don't have time for that. You don't have time for petty arguments, petty differences, petty problems. You don't have time. You're too busy trying to see how you can be a blessing. Now, let me share this as well. As God is honing you for leadership, don't overdo it. Because you have this treasure in an earthen vessel. It's not only flawed, it can also be fragile. So what you have to do is you have to remember that that vessel you live in, that you're made of, happens to be the temple of God. Which means you are the temple of God. And if you are the temple of God, the Holy Spirit abiding in you, that means you have to take care of your temple, y'all. You have to take care of it. You have to do everything you can to keep it healthy. You can't eat yourself into oblivion. You hear me? You can't work yourself to the, to the grindstone. You can't burn the candle at both ends. You're not going to win God's love by running over here and running over there and doing this and doing that. That's overdoing it. God's going to love you whether you serve him or not. Whether you're saved or not, he loves you. You have his favor when you serve him, when you live for him, when you're in him. You got his favor, baby. But don't think you're going to win more love by doing more service. That, that It's not a... It's not a merit walk. You don't get merits and demerits. No. You're in or you're out. You have to accept his love. See, what he gives you is unmerited favor, unmerited grace. It's unmerited. It's undeserved. So that you can't do enough to deserve what he's got. You can't do enough to pay him back for what he did for you. Just be yourself. When you need rest, get the rest. When you need some play, get some play. Enjoy your play. Serve him at a balance. Work at a balance. Eat at a balance. Go out at a balance. Make sure your life is balanced. Don't be so spiritually minded you're no earthly good. And don't be so worldly minded you ain't no spiritual good. No, don't do either one. Get a balance about yourself. Everything according to the Bible done in moderation. All right. So, in other words, don't overdo it. You have to take care of yourself emotionally, physically, psychologically, spiritually. You have to take care of yourself. Not be self-centered. Not be self-absorbed. The world must make me happy or I'm not happy. And if I'm not happy, nobody's happy. No, it ain't that kind of ball game either. So when you are trying to serve God and you're in preparation, get deep into the word. This is the time to get deep into the word. We're in the last days now. So you get deep in that word. You Compare yourself to the word. Compare the word to you. Ask God on a daily basis. Show me what needs to be adjusted in me. Show me what you don't like about my character. Show me myself. Help me see me, the real me. But help me not get discouraged by what I see. Help it 
I want what I see to help me know how to pray so that I can get cleaned up as quickly and healed as quickly as possible. Because some of what's flawed in you is from old baggage, baby, from years ago. Some of that old stuff that happened when you were a little kid stops you from seeing yourself any higher than this or that. I would love to be able for Pat and for Peter and Lynn to believe. For Matt, for Davina, for Andrea. I would love for Mariel. I would love for, for uh, Shannon. I would love for Jeanette. I would love you guys to know that any one of you at any given moment, if God says, I want you to run for president, I want you to be able to say, you know what? If God's got my back, it ain't about me. This is on his qualifications because I know I ain't qualified. That you would fearlessly step forward. Now, your own nature, I mean, your own knowing yourself might make you, you know, have to go before God and you got to hear from him 10, 20, 50 times. But once you're convinced, baby, you got to know that you know that you know and walk in it. Not think, oh, oh that, that, that's cute. That, that, that's, that's funny. Oh, that's so nice to say that that's, that's cute. No, 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 babe. If God says it, that's all it takes. You don't even have to believe it. If God says it, that settles it. He doesn't need you to believe it for it to settle it. If God says it, that's it. So don't think of yourself beneath a certain level. And definitely don't think of yourself more highly than you are. Just be balanced. Take yourself a step at a time, a day at a time, a morsel at a time. God will show you yourself. He will introduce you to your maker, to your strengths, to your weaknesses, to your giftings, to your abilities. He will, be, he will begin to show you that. You'll understand what you should keep, keep hands off. One thing I know, I am not an administrator. Mm -mm. I'm a visionary, but not an administrator. Someone else is probably going to carry it out better than I will. Because I'm so creative and artistic, I'm one of those disorganized folks. And organized people are excellent at getting things done, like my husband. Very methodical, very strategic. He was a great balance for me. And I didn't bug him and he didn't bug me. We just appreciated the difference and benefited from it. So know that when God is building you up for leadership, one of the things you're going to have to deal with is people and their issues. I don't know why I'm on this, but 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 I don't know if you're seeking God for your calling or what. I don't know who you are or where you are, how many of you there are. But the bottom line is, because I'm talking not only to God's church of love, I'm talking to you too. I'm talking to the body of Christ. You have got to seek God for your calling. Some of you have to fast to get the answer. Ask God how many days and ask God what kind of fast because he knows what your life entails and what's required of your energy level. He's wise. He's not going to make you go on a complete fast when you're sitting up there doing two or three jobs. I mean, come on now. He's practical. So ask him what kind of fast. Don't give yourself some impossible mission of a fast to follow through on. Ask God what kind of fast and, and ask God how many days. And then when you set that time, and when, when you set that time with God and you begin your fast, consecrate your time, turn that cell phone off, turn the TV off, get with God. He may tell you to get a strong concordance by you, a Bible. He may tell you to get a book. I remember when uh, I was fasting for my, for my uh, calling, the Lord had me get a book that somebody had given me called The Cost of Discipleship or The Cost of Leadership, one of those, dealing with the price you pay for being in leadership. And one of the prices I'm going to share right now, get ready, is loneliness. Doesn't mean that you're going to feel lonely. But you're going to spend most of your life alone. Folks will not have time to spend with you. They will not travel to come see you. 
They will not think of you when they go do this or they go do that. You will spend a lot of time alone. Baby, you better get real close with God and real in love with the things of the kingdom. That right there will be the remedy for not being lonely when nobody is around. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you. That's some of the price you pay for leadership is being alone. Another price you pay for leadership is being criticized. Criticized and rejected. Yeah, some of you will be ostracized because people won't want you around. You dampen their atmosphere because of all the light you bring into their darkness. People, how does it say? The world prefers darkness rather than light. And you are a major killjoy bringing that light in, letting everybody see your dirt. I mean, see their dirt. Anyway, I'm not going to go on. I'm going I'm to cut it short. But just know, God's got his hand on a lot of you and you don't realize it. And a lot of the challenges you're dealing with, that's God's hand. A lot of the demonic attacks he is, he's allowing, there's no demonic attack that any of us go go through that God hasn't allowed. Because he's already equipped you to deal with it. He's got to take you from fear, from intimidation to annoyance. Once you're annoyed by a demon rather than afraid, you know you've grown leaps and bounds, baby. So anyway, I'm not going to go far on that. I just want you to know that God wants you to get into the word. He wants you to stay in his face, develop a friendship, a relationship with him. It's not a just a list of our needs and a list of you do, but it's also, Lord, I love you. Lord, I bless and praise you. There's that communion, that making love to the Lord, singing to him. When was the last time you just sang a love song to him? A song of worship and praise. When was the last time you just sat and talked with him and joked with him and laughed with him? Nothing serious. Nothing about the world's problems. Just talking. Lord, you remember that day when we did so and so and you said blah, blah, blah. Boy, you cracked me up when you did that. I remember how, I don't know how you worked that. How did you work that out? That was so funny. You know, friendship, communion, because it all comes with leadership. It all comes with salvation, with relationship. You need to be able to not only speak to him and commune with him, you need to have an ear to hear what the spirit of God says to you. You got to have a heart to understand what he means when he says what he says to you. And you've got to have a spirit of humility, a meek, mild spirit, a contrite heart, a fear of God to be able to act on what he tells you, to stop what he tells you to stop doing, to make the adjustments where he highlights your imperfections. You have to be ready. Act. You have to be apt and teachable, obedient, pliable, flexible. Don't be stuck on your ways the way I always do it. I can't do it that way. It's just, no, no, you can do all things through Christ. God may stretch you beyond what you don't like. You don't like doing that because that's not comfortable for you. God will stretch you, baby. Stretch, stretch with him. Don't fight him. It's, it's so much easier when you cooperate with the truck, with the journey than when you battle with it. All right, I'm done. I just want to let you know, God's got his hands on many of you. And some of you don't realize it because you're looking at the problem rather than looking at the solver of the problem. Wondering, what am I to learn out of this, Lord? How am I to grow? What are you trying to develop in me? Show me how to love. Show me how to see people out of your eyes, not mine. Show me how to perceive life and life's vicissitudes through your eyes, not mine. 
Help me to remember how much you're in control, that you're in control of everything, even the, the what's in the light, what's in the dark. You're control, in control of everything. And I am not to fear. I'm not to be afraid because I have a risen Savior on my side. Be encouraged. Know that whatever's going on, whatever you're dealing with, whoever you're dealing with, wherever you're dealing with it, however you're dealing with it, God is the one in control. And you constantly must ask God, what am I to learn from this challenge, from that challenge, from the other challenge? What am I to learn? Open my eyes so I can see more and more of you and less of me by loving the unlovable, the unlovable and touching the untouchable. Let my actions speak louder than my words. Show me how to love in the true meaning of the word. God bless you on your journey to leadership and service. Thank you.